Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. The Boston Patriots officially joined professional football on November 22, 1959 as a member of the AFL. Upton Bell's father had passed away just a little more than a month before this watching his two teams play at Franklin Field. At that time, little did Upton know the ending of one saga and the beginning of a new one in Boston would end up leading to him becoming the youngest GM in the NFL in 1971. And maybe this chapter in Upton's life would never have happened if the NFL gave a different consideration to Lamar Hunt. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is November 22nd, 1959. And our guest from the past two episodes is still riding shotgun with his baby. This will, however, be his very last stop. But it's an important one for the journey in the NFL for Upton Bell. This is the day the Boston Patriots were officially accepted in the AFL under Billy Sullivan and some other owners. We find out in this episode how this day is significant to Upton Bell. But before we get to it, I wanted to remind you this is the last of a three-part series covering an overview of Upton Bell's book, which is titled Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game. If you have not listened to the first two episodes, well, I suggest you press pause, you head back, and you listen to those two first. And you can get those easily through your podcast player or by heading to the footballhistorydude.com forward slash Upton Bell. Again, that's the footballhistorydude.com forward slash Upton Bell. And while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest off the press episodes well each and every week. But for now, Let's dive into the last phase of the Upton Bell interview. I, I saw in the book that you had a chance to meet Muhammad Ali at the after party for Super Bowl V. Did you really talk to him that much, or was it more of a passing by? Oh yeah, well I I used to I used to because the second part of my career has been the last thirty years in and radio and television. I said Muhammad Ali. Uh, I mean, you could never get people to do this today. I said him on my radio show all the time from this training camp. Fascinating guy. Absolutely fascinating. Probably the single most important figure in sports and to a degree the outside world in the 20th century. Yeah, and we'll get to a little bit of that too in the future of your media career. And you've, again, go back to the book. You went from father, commissioner of the NFL, all the way to. Now, you know, you're in the media, but in between there, sandwiched in, you went from the championship caliber Colts to the doormat of the NFL at the time known as the Boston Patriots. What was going through your head there, man? Well, it's like everything else. I was the youngest general manager in football. You always think when you're young, you can change things, but you couldn't change things uh, enough. I got uh, hired a lot of good people and got them in place, but, but there were 32 owners. And and uh, people on the board, and you can, you can't deal with that. And it was just a mess for two years, but a lot of funny and interesting stories in it. What were the BS Patriots? They they called it, the the newspapers laughed at it. That's why I convinced them to change it. I was the one that renamed them the New England Patriots. It was the Bay State Patriots, but everybody said it's the BS Patriots, like Billy Sullivan or BS, and you know so. 
the, the, again, those two or three chapters are really funny, sad in some ways, but funny. Yeah, I mean, even though it was sad, you did a lot of good things there with the Patriots that the, you know, from the few years that you were there. I mean, even your first year, you started, you pretty much like, you tore the house down and, and started to rebuild and you started to give them a hope as far as scouting goes. I mean, do you have any specific stories that come to mind regarding that? Well, actually, what I did is they never had it. I put in a scouting system, hired Buck O'Kilroy, the legendary scout from the Cowboys, and hired four other full-time scouts, brought an assistant general manager, changed the, the whole team around, the front office, moved into a new stadium. There's so many things that we actually did, but I was always at loggerheads with the owner, Billy Sullivan, and the board of directors because they didn't want some... You know, sometimes people say they want change, but they really don't. So. But there are a lot of, as I said, stories in there. Dwayne Thomas, Players' Rebellions, you, you know, you, you name it, you're going to get it in that. Even part of your time there, you, you showed a little bit of savviness. And there was a guy, his name was Mo Mormon, in the time that you bested Hank Stram. Yep, that, that's, uh, that they tried to sneak him through as being injured. And I claimed him, which people never did on waivers in those days. And I claimed him. And... Told Stram the only way I give them back to him, even though you didn't claim people on injured waivers, which I did. But uh, Stram, I said, I'll give them back to you for a first choice. And he balked. He had Lamar Hunt call Billy Sullivan. And finally, I agreed to let him give him back an injured player for a number two choice. I wanted a number one, but there was enough pressure from Hunt that I gave him back for a two. But it had never been done up to that point. So this is not really football related, but I found something interesting in there and maybe you can kind of help me out here. You mentioned how J. Michael Curry was the mayor of Boston known as the Rascal King. Something about, did he get elected while he was in federal prison? Yeah, he did. Yep, he did. How does that happen? You have to know Boston, especially then, anything was possible. He was so popular that people didn't care. You know, maybe it's a little bit like Trump right now. With certain people. <laughs> Although I would have taken Curly's word over Trump's. Well, I won't get into any of that right here, but how did he... I know. Michael Curry, how, what, why was he in federal prison at the time? I, I believe that uh, he, he got caught in some financial schemes and that, you know, that, that were illegal. So, of course, I, I wasn't here when that happened, but I mean, the, the politics in, in Boston up till about... 20 years ago. It's still, to a degree, was really legendary. You know, there are a lot of rascals, as they say. He was the rascal king. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy to think the birthplace area of America, and we're still dealing with that over there. Uh, I wonder what the founding fathers would have thought of that. Well, I'm, I'm wondering what the founding fathers would think about today, so we'll see. Yeah, again, I'm, sometimes I say, yep, I'm going to keep my mouth shut on this one. Yep. But the Patriots didn't really work out ultimate long-term plan. Um, what took you from, you know, up-and-comer, young GM, youngest GM in the NFL at the time, and what kind of, what do you think took you out the door there? Well, you, 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 like today, to a degree, you can't get in a fight with an owner. And in those days, unlike today, uh, what happened was a lot of the owners in the league, even though we knew a, a lot of them, and the owners in the league, I, I wouldn't call it, I was careful in the book, but I essentially was blackball. <clears throat> no matter how good you are, particularly then, unlike today. Now, you know, there weren't 32 teams there. Uh, but you get in the fight with an owner, they'll say, you know what? You don't hire somebody who gets a fight with an owner. So that's what happened. Kind of blacklisted from the NFL, just roaming around. And later on in life, you end up somehow in this crazy league called the World Football League. How did that work out? Well, it was a great experience. I always went on my own team, even in, in the end of it. You know, it didn't work out. I picked a territory that today is an NFL franchise territory. I, I knew it was the right place for football, so I picked Charlotte. And I said, uh, I'll take a team from New York and take it to Charlotte, which I did. And we, we, drew, we did well for two years, but the league didn't make it. And that's the thing you find out if it, if you have no league to play in, it doesn't make any difference. But we had good teams. We had all of my players after the league went down, ended up in the NFL. 
And uh, many of my coaches, including Lindy and Plani, ended up as the head coach of the Green Bay Packers, Bob Gibson with the Giants, uh, you know, John McVay, who ended up being the general manager of San Francisco 49ers. I mean, there were a lot of terrific players of that league. It was great. But again, you, you go against the NFL, it's pretty hard to make it. But, but what I wanted to do was experience running everything, owning a team, running it in every which way. And I did. And you know what? I have no regrets. I lost a lot of money. League didn't make it. But uh, to me, it was the right thing. Yeah, I mean, going back to what you said earlier, money's not been your driving force for why you did things. You're just a fan of professional football and football in general. Well, I'm fan. I'm a fan of also taking a chance. Now, you don't want to be a fool about it, but you, you know, again, if you want to be successful in life, I've always found successful people are the ones that do what they want to do, not what somebody else wants them to do. That kind of brings me back to you mentioned about how you had some good players in the league, even though it kind of faltered and you do what you want to do. I have to ask for a friend at work because he's been bugging me about this for a little bit. How did you, not necessarily your team, but how did the WFL get Zonka and Kick and Warfield away from the Dolphins? Well, they made a mistake in some ways, like a lot of leagues, uh, is that they went out in the beginning at, at Memphis and the richer owners uh, went out and bought players, paid way overpriced for them. And John Bassett, who owned the Carling Brewing Company, or he's married to the woman, his wife, father owned it, went out and, and it was originally going to be a team in Toronto. And uh, I moved it to Memphis, but he went and signed a lot of high-priced players. I never did. I, th- I think that I knew talent well enough that I wasn't going to go out and chase them. But the league went out hot wild the first year and signed all these NFL players, paid them a fortune. As a result, they got themselves in financial trouble. And then from there on in, it was all downhill. The team that you took over, it wasn't necessarily you getting them in financial trouble. It sounded like you kind of assumed quite a bit of debt, and you were dealing with kind of different uh, issues every week almost, it sounded like. Well, it was, but it it was, I mean, I look back on now, and it's kind of of funny. I mean, we... We had, you know, one game we played, uh, they had to, like, the sheriff from a Dodge, old Dodge commercial, come in at Shreveport and, and actually take our uniforms away. He's going to take them away before the game. And we talked him out of it. And he, he finally took them away after the game. So we had to go get the uniforms out of, out of custody. <laughs> I mean, it's, there were, again, I don't want to spoil the whole uh, book for people, but the, the, the stories on the wild and woolly, World Football League and all the crazy things that happen are, you know, are, are amazing stories. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, like you said, we don't want to spoil it. There's definitely a lot of stuff in there that you make me reading. I'm like, what? How, how did they? Yeah. That, how, I know. Is this a fiction book I'm reading right now? That's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> well, it could be. But one last thing, too, about the WFL. Um, you know, we talk about Franklin Field and what it means to your family, how it kind of started at the beginning with Burt Bell and it ended with Upton Bell. I mean, how what does Franklin Field mean to you and your family? Well, a lot. I mean, my father died there, and actually my uh, my team in the World Football League died there, played their last game there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great tradition. In fact, in the book, I think the first picture in the book is of my father kicking what it looked like in his underwear, <laughs> uh, kicking and practicing at Franklin Field back in 1917. It's just one of those great iconic places. All the ghosts whistle down in the middle of the night. Chuck Benarek, his statue is in there. It's it's uh, it's you know a lot of movies have been made there. Oh, I didn't know that. And it's just yep a lot a lot of uh, movies. M Night Shyamalan's movie. Uh, God, which one was it? Uh, it might it might be the one where about the kid I hear dead people. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, but but a lot of movies have been shot there because it's such an iconic place. Remember that's Lucy was home and I read it at one time of the world famous pen relays. Huh. Yeah, because didn't your father throw the first forward pass in a Rose Bowl or one of those games? Yes, he did. He did. Nineteen seventeen. Uh, in fact, they had the hundredth anniversary, and I. I went down to Franklin Field, and they honored him, 
and the team of 1917, the Rose Bowl Committee, came in for the night, and Harvard played Penn at uh, Franklin Field. Just a crazy story at Franklin Field from the beginning to the end. There's so many chapters involving the Bells. Well, it is. And, you know, it, originally, it was the oldest stadium in America. You know, it was a wooden stadium built back in 1887 or so. So it, it's an incredible place. A lot of things happen there. I've never seen it before. Maybe I have and not realized it. Is it a, does it seat a lot of fans there? Well, at one time it had 80 or 90,000, uh, probably a less now at 60 or so. But it, it was one of the biggest stadiums of its time, and they've redone it. And it's probably about 60,000 now, but it's a perfect bowl. You can see anywhere in the stadium. Great upper deck. No elevators. Was it at one point in time uh, uh, the baseball diamond, considering baseball was uh, the, the major sport back then? No, no. Ne- ne- never never used for anything except for football and track. Really? So even when we're talking back in like your father's day, 1917, when football wasn't as popular? Never. Never, right. Well, that's pretty cool. I, I mean, college football back when your dad was... It was it. College football was, was the biggest game in America. Came a long way. I mean, we talked about um, the WFL. We talked about everything like that. Uh, one thing about the WFL, and we there was a brief time we spoke about Joe Namath and how was that the tipping point where if you if you would have got Joe Namath, you think you guys would have survived? Well, there, there was a deal I talk about it in the book. A lot of people don't know about, but the, we were willing to make a deal in the second year of the league with his agent to pay Namath to play for the Chicago win. And the deal, a lot of people didn't know it, is that we all agreed that uh, because he had such bad knees that we would, uh, we'd never knock him down. We just rushed the passer and run right by him. And he was about to make the deal, which would have given us a huge television contract. And uh, they wanted more money. And the owners in the league said, not me. The owners of the league said, no, it's too much money. And what I said to them, doesn't make any difference whether it's too much money or not. If we don't make the deal, we have no league. And we, at the end, we had no league. And there you were, sitting in Franklin Field, last game. And that's what happened. Nobody went, to, right. Yeah, in a rainstorm. And it was eerie listening to all the cleats on the artificial turf because uh, there was a strike on that night of the workers, whatever it was. And the other thing was that that basically we, we lost on that night, and two days later, the late folded. So two deaths there, my father and my team. That's, uh, that's something to say. Like I said, it, that field meant so much to you in a positive way, but at the same time, there's a lot of heartache going on there. But as with always... That's life. Yeah. Yep. In life, in Burt Bell's life, and Upton Bell's life, the band marches on. And you just, you know, even though you're out of the professional football league, you moved on to something else and the media and all that kind of thing. And how did that transition go for you? How did you even get into that? Well, I've been interviewed so much. It was like a natural. I remember, my mother was an actress. And my father was in front of the public all the time. And in my case, uh, I found the transition very easy. And within a couple of years, I was doing everything. I was doing football, doing basketball. I was doing a, a talk show. I was doing PBS TV. I was doing every, I end up doing every part of it. And now eventually I will uh, be putting out with the University of Massachusetts, the largest collection of authors in America, over 500 of ones that I've interviewed and authors and their books and every one of their books personally signed. That's a lot of authors and a lot of books. Well, it's 40 years worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You're talking to a dude that's only been doing this for a little over a year now. So I got a little bit of catching up to do. Well, enjoy it. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Oh, it has been. And uh, again, I mean, I, I talked to you about it earlier. I appreciate you giving me the chance. You, you reached out to me and I don't know if I would have jumped and taken this leap this early in my podcasting career if you had not reached out to me. So I definitely appreciate that, Upton. Well, that's good. You you should. Don't ever be afraid to take the chance. If you don't take the chance, you'll never know. Yeah, I guess they say you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. One of my episodes actually recently, um, 
I brought up the first draft, of course, you know, Burt Bell's idea to help save the league. But then I also talked about the first televised NFL draft. And I swore I saw your name in there as one of the broadcasters. Were you there? Yes, I've in fact uh, uh, was on ESPN, and it's uh, uh, who did it uh, sent a thing out from ESPN, Adam Schefter, uh, on the first draft ever done on ESPN, which was nineteen, I believe it was nineteen eighty. Yeah, we're talking Detroit Lions, my boy Billy Sims. Even though I was too young to know. <laughs> yep, terrific player. But I did that. And I also did one of the first national public broadcasting uh, back in 1977 with Kurt Gowdy Jr. went on to go to NBC. So, yeah, it's almost like I've been at the beginning of a lot of things. It's been a lot of fun and very interesting. Very common theme that I've, throughout the book that I read, you know, you're at the beginning, the creation of a lot of things. And something that struck me personally that I was interested in is, like you said, you've interviewed so many people. And so, I mean, I couldn't even begin to list them all on here, but some the three big names that stuck out to me that I was interested in was George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Stephen Hawking. Uh, what was it like interviewing those guys? Well, George, well, Herbert Walker Bush, who I and actually interviewed in 1990 at the White House for television, it's on YouTube. People can get that interview on YouTube. Uh, is the most powerful person in the world, and yet it was the nicest, one of the nicest people I've ever interviewed, interesting man, very introspective, not a braggart, uh, and just couldn't have done a better job of putting me at ease. Clinton, I remember doing him on the radio when he was running uh, in New Hampshire and all that controversy about Jennifer Flowers and everything. And I remember interviewing him at the end of the interview. I told the producer, which I said in the book, I don't know what he did. And I know he's in fourth place right now, but then he's going to be president. So, and and then with Stephen Hawking, I got lucky. And, of course, he talks through a computer, but he was terrific. And they, they liked the interview so much as people when I did it. He was in London at the time that when he came to Boston to do a, uh, an evening at the Wilbur Theater, they invited me. And I went in and I met him. And the thing that I remember thinking was, here's one of the great geniuses since Einstein, but how horrible. He's stuck in a chair. Yeah, he's stuck in a chair, but his mind was the biggest thing of all. Oh, I know, no, I, I agree with you. It was, it was incredible, but still, that that's just one of the many, and they were three absolutely of the best, but there are a lot of other people that were absolutely fascinating too, so Kind of a who's who. When this collection comes out, you'll be able to see it because you, you'll be able to get it online all over the world. Oh, definitely. Um, when you do, if you could send me that link, too, and I can I can put that on the show and, and blast it out for you as well. Absolutely. That would be great. Uh, one thing that I saw, too, is, and I don't know, this came up, and it was even before I was even found your book, but uh, I saw that you presented Bill Hewitt at the Hall of Fame ceremony, what was the reason why he chose you? Uh, because he played for my father, and he was the last person to play pro football without a helmet. And he wasn't the wife. His family picked me to do it. And that was the time, I think I put in the book, that, that uh, Nixon came in for the ceremony, and Nixon and I ended up sitting next to each other, and I'm telling Nixon about a deal I'm going to make for Dwayne Thomas. And Nixon said to me, oh, make the deal. Stupidly, I made the deal. And, of course, Thomas only lasted four days because he had a drug problem. So <laughs> so you get the green light from the commander-in-chief, and then it turned out the wrong yeah. way, huh? <laughs> yeah. What do you expect? It was Nixon. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I would say no on that regard either. Yeah, well, it, it I mean, it wasn't the final thing. It's just Nixon knew a lot about football. He really did. He was very smart. Nixon was a very smart man, self-destructive, but that's what happened. But there was an interesting evening talking football with Nixon. Was that the first time you really had conversation with him, or did you guys have a previous history? No, I had met him years ago when he when he came to Detroit and, and uh, tried to to put the pressure on uh, with Governor Williams to, to take the take the uh, championship game, put it on television after it was sold out. My father said, "I can't do that because." I can't screw the fans that had basically 
you know, paid their way in to see this game, and now they're putting the pressure on. But he doesn't remember me because I was a kid then. I didn't really talk to him. I just sat at the table. Was that the creation of the blackout games, or was that not the first time? Well, no, but, but, but that was a championship game before that my father put the blackout in to protect the teams because unlike today, you know, teams wouldn't show out. They knew the game was going to be on free TV. Nobody would show up. So he put it in, and he kept that blackout in until 10 years after his death when they finally uh, lifted the whole thing. And part of it was pressure from Nixon when he was in the White House. I mean, for teams back then, that was a higher percentage for their, their gross, wasn't it, compared to what it is now? Well, sure. The, the home gate up until probably the middle or late 70s was was what got you by. Yeah, so if you don't have the home gate, and like you said, if the fans just say, oh, I can sit at home and I can watch it, then, I mean, bye-bye. There goes the NFL. Right. Well, that's another way my father protected the lake. Yeah, there's... um. I have 20 fingers and toes last time I checked, but I'm pretty sure that I need more of them to count how many times your father saved the league and protected it. I know. It's it's an amazing story. No, I was going to say, speaking of that amazing story, I would love to see this in a cinematic type of movie. Is that something that you've ever considered or anybody's considered? Well, I've talked to some people about it. In fact, you know, it's funny when my father died, uh, there was a deal made with Universal that Danny Thomas played Burt Bell. And for some reason or other, my mother turned it down. I don't know what it was. Maybe they didn't think it was legitimate enough or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, so some people have talked to me about it. It's a gamble, but it's a great story. I mean, it's like you're you're always at the edge of the mountain, and you've got to figure out how to pull yourself out of it with all the different adventures I had. So we'll see. Never know. As a fan and someone who is now really diving into and learning about the history of the NFL and how important he was. He was a cog in the machine that is the NFL now. He started a lot of it. So I, I personally would love to see that come out. And I hope that they do sometime get that in a, a motion picture so more people can understand how it was. And we, we right now, we're cushiony. We, we, we're we just complacent with the NFL. We assume it's always going to go on, but it wasn't the case back then. And I'd like to see fans understand that. Well, Ernie, I hope you're right. They should especially on the anniversary, 100th anniversary. We'll see what happens. Yeah, speaking of the 100th anniversary, I mean, I didn't do this on purpose, and I didn't realize it when I started the podcast, but what a way to start a history football podcast with the 100th anniversary season, you know? Perfect time to do it. Something that I do in all the episodes, um, like I said, I take the listener back in my DeLorean to the history, some point in time in history, and I would like to know, where does Upton Bell want to take my DeLorean to? And it can't be, let's not talk about something that we've already talked about. If you can go any point in history and it doesn't even have to be sports, where would you go? But you can't change the outcome. Um, I've, in some ways, because it was such a monumental time, I, I would probably say I'd like the DeLorean to go back to where I was, back to the future. Think about it. You came out of the First World War. You went into the Second World War. College football was was it. Uh, the country was dealing with so many things. Gangsters, characters, Hollywood was coming about. All the things that today we take for granted, if you look from the 30s through almost the 2000s, you will see that. I mean, I could say I'd like to go back to the Old West, uh, but I saw part of the Old West because I went across on trains back in the in the uh, middle 40s, when there were still Native Americans, you'd stop in Santa Fe and places like that that still getting out and, and uh, selling their wares and dancing on the top of the train. I would be happy to take the DeLorean and go back to where I was and then have it end up around today so you would see the values. And the country was in such I mean, people think now about the Internet, how it changed it, television, a lot of things. But th there was such a vibrancy to those times. And characters, there's no characters anymore. Everybody is made up. You know what I mean? Everybody's got a gig. Then there were genuine characters, sports, politics, music, art, you name it. Yeah, a time of which... Until I invent that DeLorean, I'm never really going to ever see. I, unfortunately, I I am intrigued by that time, though. And I listen to a podcast called Hardcore History all the time with Dan Carlin. And yep. Have you listened to that before? 
No, I have not, but I heard of it. I would highly recommend it. And he, he talks about various times in history. And the one that really pulled me in was around around that time frame. Normally it's around military and things like that. But just he tells such a story that he drops you into that moment. And it's just something that I, I can't describe on, on a podcast myself. But I would highly recommend it to you, even though this is a sports podcast. <laughs> Well, that's fine, but but this is really what we're talking about. It's not only sports, but it's it's life, and there's a lot of other things to it that have nothing to do with sports. Yeah, and that that brings up a good point. I when I first started this show, I considered a um, you know, various different you know fantasy football dude and all these kinds of different podcasts, and I try to figure out what am I going to get into that's a niche market. And something I thought about was writing a book down the road of all the interesting and unique stories I've heard of what can we learn from sports? What can we learn from football? And you brought up a lot of good things of this happens to you. Just keep on your horse and keep going. And, you know, things like that. I think it'd be kind of good to have a chapter that involves what could you learn from the Baltimore Colts and how they were as a team back in the the late 50s and that kind of thing. Well, there's a lot of lessons out there. And I'd like people, as we finish this podcast, I'd like young people that are listening to this uh, get off their phones and their games and all the other things for a while and, and really begin to think and learn uh, because we're we're raising a whole generation of people that, that they know fantasy football, but they don't know football. They are great at texting and messaging and all the other stuff. When's the last time they read a book? When's the last time that they really had a real experience? That's lost. How many hours are lost every day by that? I live life to the fullest, to the hilt, and still I have a cell phone, I have computers, everything else, but they're not my gods. Yeah, and that was going to be one of the things I wanted to ask you before we ended up wrapping this whole thing up. Did you have any kinds of words of wisdom or anything you'd like to share with the listeners of this show? Well, again, it's repetitive, some of the themes, but they're really important. First and foremost, listen, listen and and learn. You know, don't don't spend all your time watching. Participate, participate in life. Listen, but participate, and understand that there are going to be a lot of rough patches, and you better be up for it. There are three of the things, but I would say whatever business you're in, try to learn somebody else's. You know, I left sports about 20 years ago uh, to do just straight radio talk. And that's how I end up with my with my about the collection of almost 500 books, right? I've interviewed people from all over the world, from every type of author you can think of. And most of it isn't sports. I decided I'm going in a different direction. That's what life is. And finally, I would say to you in finishing up, for people to know this, when you're on your deathbed, nobody's ever going to ask you how much money you made or how important you were uh, or how many people knew who you are. What you're going to ask yourself is, did I take the ride in my DeLorean? Did I actually do the things I wanted to do? Or did I do things just to do them? There it goes. That's it. I don't think you could have said it any better, and I do appreciate it. I came into this podcast interview expecting to talk about football. I'm leaving with some great football information, but I'm also leaving with some great life information and things that can help me in my forward future for me, my family, and everybody that's listening. And um, I'll definitely make sure, again, I'm going to put your uh, book. There'll be a, a link in the show notes to your book on the Amazon, Present at the Creation. Is there anywhere else that you would like the listeners of the show to go? regarding information on you or any of your anything that you've done in the past? Well, there's stuff all over the place. There's 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 so much family history. They can go practically anywhere. I do know this, it's really interesting. The oldest fan website in America is the World Football Charlotte Hornets website uh on a team that's actually been out of business since 1975. Really? Think about that. It's run by Richie Franklin. Go on, take a look at it. Is Richie Franklin, he's still around? Yep, still alive. Still running the website. 
Okay, well, uh, that might be someone in the future I might have to get a hold of. <laughs> I'd be happy to help, Barney. Happy to help. All right, well, Upton, I, again, thank you for coming to the show and taking me ride on my DeLorean. We're going to get that baby up to 88 miles an hour, and let's go visit somewhere else in the past. I like it. Shoot for the stars. Shoot for the stars we shall. And considering where the NFL was when Upton's father, Burt Bell, took over as commissioner, well, I would say that in the upcoming 100th season of the NFL, it surely has had that liftoff power comparable to SpaceX Rocket Falcon Heavy. But on a serious down-to-earth note, I do want to thank Upton Bell for riding shotgun with us for the past three episodes and being gracious enough to tell his story, which, like he said, present at the creation. But that's what it was craziness from the beginning, twist of fate, maybe some things where he said oftentimes throughout the interview, you gotta be at the right place at the right time, you better take hold. And again, like he said, let's shoot for the stars. And if you wanted to go ahead and get more on Upton Bell and even read his book, which I highly suggest, super interesting, something that I could not put down, then I welcome you to take a gander at Upton Bell's page on the Football History Dude website. I included an Amazon link to his book, Present at the Creation, and also a few more tidbits, you know, these gold knowledge nuggets we keep talking about. And to check this out and more, then you can head to thefootballhistorydude.com forward slash Upton Bell. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com forward slash Upton Bell. Now next week, we're going to take that DeLorean, we're going to go back a few years, and we're going to learn about a man that preceded Burt Bell as the first commissioner of the NFL. Elmer Layden. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.